And this is this week in prophecy. We're now into the month of June. It has been wonderful to be in the USA. Next week we shall be, Lord willing, in the Republic of Ireland in Dublin. But right now, let's continue with this week in prophecy. And as usual, what a week it has been. Again, this week in prophecy in Great Britain, we see the war being waged by the Theresa May government against democracy and democratic freedom. Tommy Robinson was arrested today in Leeds in the UK outside the courthouse. A few hours later, he was sentenced to 13 months in prison. I've never heard of that before. Normally there's an alleged offense, then an arrest, then the charges, then lawyers get involved, then a first court appearance, and maybe bail, and then disclosure of documents, and then a trial, and then a conviction, and then a sentence, and then an appeal. Normally that takes months, maybe years, but this happened today in just a few hours from Tommy standing on the street laughing, talking, to be sent to prison for 13 months? That happened in the United Kingdom today, and while Tommy Robinson is the man who was condemned, I think the UK courts, well, they committed murder of their own reputation for liberty and law. Let me show you the moment it happened. Here is the arrest filmed by Tommy's own cameraman. The content of what I'm streaming, I've been arrested for breach Are you arresting him? I've been arrested for breach of peace. You've all watched this. Oh You've all watched God. this. Oh. You've all watched this. You've all watched this. Can you get me a solicitor? Can you get me a solicitor? Can you just turn off your light feed? Yes. Can you get me a solicitor? Just turn off your light feed, please. Yeah? Do you understand what I just said? No, can you explain it again? I've been arrested for breach of peace. What does that mean? 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 What does that yeah. Not at all. I've never said that. That's the information I've got. I'm inciting people. I'm inciting people. Have you not through with video? How have I incited people? You haven't. This is free speech. This is this is where we're at. You're not even allowed to. Look at this. Look how many people. Tommy, what are you trying to hide? Do you know when you do this? More people. More people. More people. Just let him do this. More people are going to watch this now than ever. This is ridiculous, lads. Do you feel right what you're doing it? I haven't said a word. I, so, in fact, someone laid their hand and assaulted me outside court. Yeah, exactly. Other people have swore at me and threatened me about my mother, and here I am being arrested for saying nothing. I'm threatened to be I've done nothing. You know, said anything about what are they arresting you for, Tommy? Breach, Breach of the peace. peace. Apparently, I'm inciting on my video. Can you please, George, get me a solicitor? Yeah, so because I'm on a suspended sentence. The British rights activist, who's a true British patriot, Tommy Robinson, was simply standing in front of a court in Leeds, England, where Islamic gangs were grooming girls for prostitution. It's not the first time that this happened. And there was a major cover-up of this happening at a place called Rotherham, England, in South Yorkshire, Leeds being in West Yorkshire. And it was Islamic gangs but it was the local Labour Party Council who sequestered everything because they did not want to offend the Muslim community by pointing out it was Asian crime perpetrated by Muslims. So too, Theresa May is afraid of the same thing. She will make war against the rights of British citizens, have them prosecuted by the Crown in order not to offend the Muslim community at the same time, radical Muslims, and not all Muslims are radical, but radical Muslims have run people over in, in, on, in a bridge in London, stabbed people in front of Parliament, put bombs in a concert in Manchester, and Theresa May is worried about offending the Muslim community. Tommy Robinson was then arrested. S swift injustice given 13 months in prison, and any media reporting was outlawed by the same judge who sentenced him. The Crown prosecutor prosecuted him. Why did Theresa May allow this prosecution? Why did the British Home Office and Michael Gove allow this prosecution? The fact is he had done the same at a previous Islamic trial of Muslims engaged in similar crimes against the British people.
And at that time, he was given a warning that he would be imprisoned if he did it again. But he was arrested for disrupting the peace. The film footage shows he wasn't disrupting any peace. He was simply standing there and reporting news for the Internet. What would be covered by First Amendment rights in the United States, he was arrested and with no per se trial, put in jail for 13 months, and the media was told he couldn't report it. Theresa May or Joseph Stalin? Are they six of one, half dozen of the other? That's what some people are asking. There were protests outside of number 10 Downing Street. It is a sad day for British democracy. Please pray for justice for Tommy Robinson. Pray for his family and pray for his salvation. He is a man who was guilty of nothing more than telling the truth, the victim of a politically motivated prosecution the way Geert Wilders was in Holland. That's all. He is a British rights activist. He is a patriot. I do not believe he hates Asians. I do not believe he hates Muslims. His problem is with radical Islam and the impact it is having on British society and Islamic immigration where radicals come into Britain by those channels claiming to be refugees and demanding asylum and things of this nature which Ms. May, like the Labour government, has consistently pandered to. We had an instance of a woman who challenged vehement Muslim speakers at Speaker's Corner in England. They were praying in violation of the policies of the park, using Speaker's Corner as a mosque. They were disrupting a pathway. When she protested to the police, the police told her that they have orders to let the Muslims break the law, essentially. Later on, she's in her house. And the police knock on the door and say, it's the police, we want to talk to you, we want to talk to you. And she says, I don't want to open the door, do you have a warrant, or so forth. We, just, we want to talk to you. Once she lets them in, under pressure, they grab her and arrest her and drag her out, put her in jail, charging her with some kind of a hate crime or something. Because a homosexual rights activist, quote unquote, stated, that he was offended by something she said to him. She said, have a gay day, according to his report, and she's in jail. And just using that, which she shouldn't have been arrested for, to get at him, to get at her, for objecting to Muslims violating the legal policies, the policies that are legally adopted by London Council, London having a Muslim mayor. This is what is happening in Britain. I'm just going to say to you, if other people, and this is, nobody's allowed to do it, okay? Right. For some reason, they think they're separate. Right. And they can do it, nobody else, it doesn't matter. Well, and that's what the problem is, is that they're being treated differently to everybody else according to the to, rules. Yeah. No, it's not. Right. It shouldn't be. I've been told but it's you, allowed to happen. Yeah, okay. why? Why? Why is it allowed? I don't question everything. Yeah, Otherwise, you never get anywhere. So you go against the regulations of the park because... You have to ban all sort of exercise. Because my boss So what's the point of having regulations well, if you don't follow them? Okay, well, I'm not the only person that's done that and well, you sort of singled you, me out. Well, because you happen to be standing here. here. Hang on a second, I just need to call somebody. I've never had... What, can, why were you not telling me what you're doing? Please. Why are you... Just tell me, what is going on? I will do, would you open the door? I need to speak to you about something. As in what? Would you please open the door? I'd like you to tell me through the door what you're doing. No, I need to, you to open the door. So Why? Face to face. Why? Open the door and then I can discuss it with you. I don't really want to discuss it in the hallway. I don't really trust you. I don't know what... Why are you... But what is your What is your purpose? And what's your purpose? Pardon? This is very sinister. Why okay. are you If you just open the door you'll see or you can call one zero one and confirm who we are. But we need to come in and speak to you. 
I don't want you coming into my flat. I want to know, listen, I'm telling you now, I need to know what you're doing and why you're here. And you can tell me through the door. No, I will tell you when I see you. Why? You can hear me. I need to speak to you. I don't trust you. I don't trust you. I don't, I've never had the police come like this. Okay. Who's called you? Nobody called me. I need to speak to you about a matter. What matter? This is very weird. Open the door, please. Are you going to arrest me? Open the door, please. Are you going to arrest me? Tell me now. Why? What have I done? This is very weird. This is just too weird for words. Wait a minute, no, I don't know, I don't know, this is so weird. I'm going to phone somebody, because I don't trust it. You sound very sinister, you sound extremely, I don't trust, I don't know, this is weird. You are, you're saying you're the police, and you're ordering me to open my door for some reason, and you won't tell me why. If you open the door, then I can discuss the matter. Alright, I've got to phone somebody first. This is weird. The police are outside my door. The police, I'm, I'm worried. The police are outside my door. I don't know what's going on. I feel like I'm gonna be arrested. I don't know what, you know, she's not telling me what it is. Well, that's a bit excessive. Um. No poppy. This is very scary. You're not even telling me. Are you going to arrest me or what? Open the door, please, Andy. Otherwise, we'll have to... What is your name? What is your name? Please open what is your name? Please Sorry? Open the door. Wait, what's your name? PC Lamborn. Yes. And why are you outside my door? About what? About what? What about? You can, you know, you do not have to force my door open. I've done nothing wrong, so I don't. Who's called you? This is just so weird. I've net. This is very surreal. And you're not going to tell me what it's about. All right. So I'm. Um, what time is it? It's 10 to 9 in the morning, on a Tuesday morning, and the police are at my door, filming. I can see your footage going, and I'm going to open my door, and I'm filming what is going on. You're okay, not coming in. No, no, you're not coming. You no. need to come out then. You're not. Okay. okay. What are you doing? You need to come out. Right. What are you doing? At this time, you're under arrest. Okay. okay. For what? About in the course of justice. What? Yeah. Course of justice. Do not resist us. What are you doing? Do not. Do not. Do not. Resist us. Do not. 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 Do
of a divorcee and an unsuccessful movie actress from Hollywood. And they made a big issue of the fact that she happens to be half Afro-American to Prince Harry. I remember when Prince Harry's parents, Prince Charles and Princess Diana, were married in St. Paul's Cathedral. It was the fairy tale wedding of the century. It ended in adultery, scandal, divorce, and ultimately tragedy. Prince Harry and his brother were products of that failed marriage and a dysfunctional family. And now he's married this divorcee. In the late 1940s, the King of England also had an American girlfriend named Mrs. Miss Wallace. He abdicated. He couldn't stay king because of the sanctity of marriage. That's gone. Now, Meghan Markel says she's going to use her position as someone married to the grandson of the queen to promote homosexual and lesbian rights. That's what she's going to do. This is what's become a Britain. More sickening was the religious nuptial ceremony. Justin Wolby, the Archbishop of Canterbury, and a rather reprehensible American bishop who African Anglicans don't even recognize as an Anglican clergyman because of his positions on same-sex marriage and things of this nature. Uh, they sang the John Lennon song, Imagine, as a love song, Imagine There's No Heaven. No hell below us. Well, there is a heaven and there is a hell. And if these people don't repent, they're going to go there, according to what's written in the New Testament. That's what was merchandised as love and presented as love by the Church of England. The whole thing is just absurd. But it's been happening this week in prophecy. Before Brexit, I saw the monarchy as valuable for two reasons. One, tourist revenues, but more importantly, it was a symbol of British identity and sovereignty against an incringing, unelected socialist bureaucracy of Brussels, the EU. Now after Brexit, if it is indeed implemented, what are we seeing? A monarchy that no really not really serving any legitimate purpose anymore politically or nationally, in my view. There are certain countries where a monarch is needed, such as Thailand, where it gives a stability that would not be there otherwise. In Britain, what's the point other than to see tourists come to pay money to watch the changing of the guard and to visit the crown jewels in the Tower of London? Okay, it's a tourist industry. But that's all it should be, and it shouldn't be respected as anything more if that's the way the royals are going to behave. There were better days. Now, I understand there's been a long history of this kind of moral corruption in the, in the British royal families. This goes back not only to Henry VIII, but to Richard III, certainly King James. It's always been there. But it's back again. And it's showing a very ugly and hypocritical face. But it happened. And it happened this week. We have often pointed out the prophetic significance of the countries in Europe reconfederating into some kind of a remix of the Roman Empire in fulfillment of the prophecies of the Hebrew prophet Daniel. But this has been attempted at other times in history by Charlemagne, by Napoleon. This is not the first time. But at this time, it is happening in conjunction with the rebirth of Israel and the return of the Jews to Jerusalem. This time is different. We are seeing a growing alienation between the United States and Europe, and also multiple divisions within Europe itself. The trade wars are something being discussed as a possibility of happening between China and, and the United States, but also even between the EU and the United States. Now, rather hypocritically, the European Union 
has had import duties on steel and aluminum, or as we say in England, aluminum products for some time. Trade is never a two-way street with your competitors when your competitors are not committed to an even playing field. The EU was run by an unelected socialist bureaucracy. Great Britain could find its way out of this by giving the British people what they voted for, Brexit, and stop dragging their feet, as the Theresa May government is doing. Theresa May is a pawn of Europe, not a representative of the interests of Britain. She's there wrongly. The people voted for Brexit. They should have had a Brexit prime minister, and everything continually goes wrong and their negotiations with Europe on how to leave and when to leave as a result. Be that as it may, Britain, if it did leave, could negotiate a separate agreement with the United States, allowing for British exports. It is Brexit that is holding it up, not actually President Trump. President Trump is also, at the same time, speaking of pulling out of NAFTA completely and negotiating separate agreements with Canada and Mexico <coughs> on the rationale that their two economies are so diverse. Be that as it may, within Europe, another government has come to Italy. Italian governments last until the next coffee break. It's unbelievable how quickly Italian governments rise and fall. It is a negotiated one, but the one that is there is not strongly sympathetic to Europe. It is not strongly sympathetic to the Euro. Italy basically has two currencies now. It has a system of IOUs that are functioning in the international banking and capital markets as if they were actual currency and alternative to the Euro. Due to corruption, the government of Spain fell this week to be replaced by a new socialist prime minister, but he only has less than one quarter of the seats in the Spanish National Parliament. It's a complete and utter shambles, a complete and utter shambles, and it's getting worse. What does this mean in terms of prophecy? It means what Daniel said, iron and clay do not adhere to each other. They try to make it adhere, but it does not. If these European leaders and Eurocrats would read the scriptures, they might understand their dilemma. But of course, they could care nothing about the scriptures. We've seen a further instance of this this week in prophecy, where the government of President Emmanuel Marcon in France voted against Israel again in the United Nations. On the Kuwaiti, resolution condemning Israel for the Gaza killings. This is despite the fact that Hamas admits that upwards of 80% of those killed by the Israelis were harmless terrorists or people put in harm's way as human shields by the Hamas terrorists. Yet there was not a word in the resolution blaming Hamas for anything. Fortunately, the United States vetoed it. Again, this is one of the reasons God is blessing America and it's doing so well economically, the lowest unemployment now in nearly 20 years, and the lowest unemployment among ethnic minorities, especially blacks, and of course Hispanics, probably in history. We are seeing God's hand of blessing on America, I will bless them that bless thee, and curse them that curse thee, Well, we are seeing God's hand of curse on the French. Despite the fact that they have so many problems with Islamic terror themselves within their own borders continually and repeatedly, the reaction of Macron government is to genuflect towards Mecca and pander to Islamic radicalism. Voting against Israel over its handling of Gaza when people were trying to burst the fences and violently get into Israel to per perpetrate terrorist crimes. Despite the fact most of them are admitted by Hamas to have been active members of Hamas, that is a terrorist organization, recognized as such by both the USA and the European Union as well as by Israel. 
<laughs> the hypocrisy of France and so much of Europe concerning Israel seems to know no end. Mark my words, they will reap what they have sowed. Again, Obadiah 15, Genesis 12, 1 to 3. France continually puts itself under the curse, not just of Islamic radicalism, but of the divine hand of protection being taken away from France because of what they're doing to Israel. How do you explain it? It is not even anti-Zionism, it's anti-Semitism. Can you imagine if terrorists were trying to forcibly enter France and kill French citizens? What would the French response be? And then to condemn Israel for doing the same thing without mentioning Hamas. Well, that's the way it's been this week in prophecy. But the resolution was proposed by Kuwait at a very time when the Gulf states, including Saudi Arabia, are trying to supposedly cozy up to Israel in the face of the Iranian threat. The Kuwaitis forget that the diasporic Palestinian Arab population in Kuwait supported Saddam Hussein's invasion of Kuwait. And after the Americans and their allies liberated Kuwait in 1991, the Kuwaitis went on a violent pogrom, killing countless numbers of Palestinian Arab Muslims inside Kuwait in their own country. They themselves waged a pogrom against their own Arab Muslim Palestinian population. For Kuwait, of all countries, to do what they're doing is hypocritical and hideous, almost as hideous as the French and certain other governments were supporting it this week in prophecy. Much capital was made this week in prophecy by Hamas when it agreed to a supposed ceasefire. The Israelis gave the nod and things calmed down for exactly 41 hours. 41 hours. Then rocket attacks resumed, 130 rocket attacks fired from Gaza into the Eshkol region of Israel only yesterday, Shabbat, sending Israelis and their children into shelters. This, however, was not the main source of the problem. Now helium balloons, as well as the kites flying incendiary devices, have set a massive forest fire at one of Israel's largest conservation areas and reserves. Why, why? What over? 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 Go, bona, they're at my Go! North of the Gaza Strip near Ashkelon. This is the uh, Crimea Reserve where there's also located an agricultural college called Sapir College, uh, where they specialize in the cultivation of various trees. This is an important institution in Israel for research into de-desertification and for training scientists and agronomic engineers in de-desertification and how to make deserts bloom and produce fruit trees, vines, citrus products, and so forth and it's burning almost out of control, with fires set from Gaza by kites and by balloons. The international media is ignoring this. It's the equivalent of an airstrike designed to spread terror and to burn down forests and vineyards and an agricultural facility and a large nature reserve. Can you imagine if another country did that 
to the United States or to Canada or to any country in Europe, what would the response be when they're sending incendiary devices, setting massive, massive forest fires by the use of these kites and balloons? How would any rational country respond? Yet Israel is condemned for it by France, by Kuwait, and by others. You cannot make peace with the Palestinian Arab Muslims. It's just not possible. With Jordan, possible. Egypt, possible. Lebanon, may, maybe, if the Christian and Druze population was able to get control from the Iranian-controlled Hezbollah. But to make peace with either the Palestinian Authority or with Hamas is an impossibility. Land for peace has never worked. The Israelis withdrew from Gaza, and they're still fighting an occupation, as they call it, when there, were, when there are no Israelis even in Gaza. Once they were given the land in exchange for peace unilaterally, they simply used the land to continue their jihad against Israel. Yet France attacks Israel instead of attacking Hamas in this UN resolution. It's almost beyond belief. We are all concerned about violence in the Middle East. The United States deplores the loss of human life. But there is a lot of violence throughout the region. And I will note that the double standard is all too common in this chamber and working overtime today. Last week, Iranian forces attacked small positions. Sorry, last week, Iranian forces attacked Israeli positions on the Golan Heights by launching rockets from Syria. This was a reckless provocation and escalation that must be stopped. It is an example of regional violence that should occupy our attention here in the Security Council. Also last week, Iranian proxy forces in Yemen launched missiles into Saudi Arabia. It was not the first time they have done it. This too is regional violence that should occupy our attention here in the Security Council. In recent days, Hamas terrorists, backed by Iran, have incited attacks against Israeli security forces and infrastructure. That is violence that should occupy our attention too. The common thread in all of this is the destabling conduct of the Iranian regime, a regime that insists on promoting violence throughout the Middle East while depriving its own people of basic human rights. The United States welcomes a discussion of this violence in the Middle East. We welcome discussing the ways we can cooperate with each other to put an end to this violence. There is far too little discussion in the Security Council on Iran's destabilizing presence in Syria, its promotion of violence in Yemen, its support for terrorism in Gaza, and its dangerous and illegal weapons buildup in Lebanon. However, in the minds of some, today's meeting was not called to discuss any of those examples of violence in the Middle East. Today's meeting was called to discuss the violence that some suggest was connected with yesterday's opening of the United States Embassy in Jerusalem. For some people, the embassy opening is said to be a reason to engage in violence. How is that justified? As our president said when he announced the decision in December, the location of our embassy has no bearing on the specific boundaries of Israeli sovereignty in Jerusalem or the resolution of contested borders. It has no bearing on Jerusalem's holy sites. It does not prejudge whatever the parties might negotiate in a peace agreement. It does not undermine the prospects for peace in any way. And yet, for some, this is supposedly a cause for violence. But let's remember that the Hamas terrorist organization has been inciting violence for years, long before the United States decided to move our embassy. In recent days, multiple news organizations have documented the Hamas incitement in Gaza. They have reported that Hamas maps and social media show the fastest routes to reach Israeli communities in case demonstrators make it through the security fence. 
They have reported on Hamas messages over loudspeakers that urge demonstrators to burst through the fence, falsely claiming Israeli soldiers were fleeing, when in fact they were not. The same loudspeakers are used by Hamas to urge the crowds to, quote, get closer, get closer to the security fence. Hamas has attacked the Karim Shalom crossing, the biggest entry point in Gaza for fuel, food, and medical supplies. This is how determined they are to make the lives of the Palestinian people miserable. They light Molotov cocktails attached to kites on fire and attempt to fly them into Israel to cause as much destruction as possible. When asked yesterday why he put a swastika on his burning kite, the terrorist responded, quote, the Jews go crazy when you mention Hitler, unquote. This is what is endangering the people of Gaza. Make no mistake, Hamas is pleased with the results from yesterday. I asked my colleagues here in the Security Council, who among us would accept this type of activity on your border? No one would. No country in this chamber would act with more restraint than Israel has. In fact, the records of several countries here today suggest they would be much less restrained. Those who suggest that the Gaza violence has anything to do with the location of the American embassy are sorely mistaken. Rather, the violence comes from those who reject the existence of the state of Israel in any location. Such a motivation, the destruction of a United Nations member state, is so illegitimate as to not be worth our time in the Security Council, other than the time it takes to denounce it. Yesterday's opening of our, of our embassy in Jerusalem is a cause for celebration for the American people. Moving the U.S. Embassy to Jerusalem was the right thing to do. It reflects the will of the American people. It reflects our sovereign right to decide the location of our embassy, a right that everyone in this room claims for their own country. Importantly, moving our embassy to Jerusalem also reflects the reality that Jerusalem is the capital of Israel. It has served as Israel's capital since the founding of the state. It is the ancient capital of the Jewish people. There is no plausible peace agreement under which Jerusalem would no longer remain the capital of Israel. This week in prophecy also, the co-leader of the German alternative right-wing party, uh, known as alternative in Germany, his name being Alex Garland, has said, although Germany was responsible for the 12 years of Adolf Hitler, it is a small speck of history. This was responded to by Angela Merkel, who is committed to bringing a million Arab Muslims into Germany, despite the rapes and sexual attacks on German women being captured on television. Again, it was referred to as a speck of feces. That's what the Holocaust and the Blitzkrieg was in the response of Merkel's Christian Democratic Party to the co-party leader of the alternative party in Germany. Again, iron does not adhere to clay, but these countries don't even have a consensus about themselves. We have warned of the rise of neo-Nazism in Germany consistently. We have seen it in the German judiciary, where Palestinian, or I'm sorry, where Arab Muslim terrorists who attacked the synagogue were told they were not terrorists, and this was not a hate crime. It was a political action only by the German courts. We've seen the German courts using laws dating from Hitler's legal code against Christian homeschoolers, with the Obama administration refusing to give those families visas to come to the United States. We have seen Angela Merkel's pandering to radical Islam and to Islamic Muslim immigration without any vetting of the people she is bringing in. And with it comes Islamofascism and Islamic, radical Islamic anti-Semitism. 
Now, again, the legacy of Hitler and the Holocaust is being downplayed. This is a problem. This is quite a problem. Germany remains Germany. Unless Germany turns to Christ, it's always going to go back to its old Teutonic ways. It's always going to be a country in the character of its ancestors. It will always be. You can occupy Germany as Russia occupied East Germany. You can liberate and liberalize Germany as the Americans did to West Germany. But when you take your hands off Germany, Germany becomes Germany. There are very few believers in Germany, and God bless those who are there. There are some believers in Germany who support Israel, and may God bless them. But Germany as a nation, I'm afraid, remains to be Germany as a nation. And so it goes this week in prophecy. This week in prophecy. While we often focus on the Middle East, the tenets of radical Islam extend further, particularly further east into Asia. There was an attack in Spinagar, India, in the Kashmir. Two Indian paramilitary troops and eight others were injured, two killed, eight injured, by Pakistani soldiers on the border of Kashmir. Remember, India and Pakistan both have nuclear weapons. But unlike the West or the Cold War, the BJP in India, the radical Hindu party, would have no problem with a nuclear attack because of their belief in karma and reincarnation. They'd come back as a Brahmin or something. Pakistan, controlled by radical Muslims, which it very easily could become, has a nuclear arsenal, and they have no problems using nuclear weapons because of their belief in the doctrine of shahadi. The only assurance of salvation is to die in a jihad. These people, as has been pointed out, love death the way civilized human beings love life. Now, I'm not saying all Muslims are that, but there is that fundamentalist element, and they are prominent in much of Pakistan. You could easily see a war between India and Pakistan happening again. There's been at least six since the British partition of India and Pakistan in the late 1940s, at least six. At some point, we should not be surprised if that mushrooms into a regional nuclear exchange. But once more, Hindu and Sikh India are shooting at Islamic Pakistan in response to the Pakistani attacks in Kashmir this week in prophecy. This week in prophecy, Syrian President Assad, who's now simply a lapdog for Mr. Putin, has called for the withdrawal of all American and Western forces from Syria even though elements of ISIS still exist and operate in eastern Syria and would mushroom again if they could. He did not call for the removal of Russian or Iranian forces from Syria. Well, that's not going to happen. Rather, something else is taking place this week in prophecy. USA for the last three to four weeks has increased its reconnaissance activity with drones, surveillance drones, and reconnaissance aircraft over coastal Syria and Lebanon. It's going 24-7, looking for all movement, be it Syrian, Russian, or otherwise. In the meantime, the Iranian Revolutionary Guard commander of the Al-Quds Brigade of the Iranian Revolutionary Guards, Qasem Soleimani, has vowed to take the fight to Israel. Now, there's been much confusion in the media this week in prophecy. Why is that? On one hand, there have been reports 
that Syria is restricting access now to airfields to, to Iranian aircraft inside Syria. And that Syria has begun to pull away from cooperation with Iran, supposedly at the behest of Mr. Putin, who has been speaking with the Israeli Prime Minister and the Defense Minister. Israel, however, has vociferously denied it has had any breakthrough in its dealings with Russia concerning Russia's ability to control the actions of the Assad government. What is taking place actually this week in prophecy is the following. Hezbollah terrorists from southern Lebanon are being given Syrian military uniforms operating as an adjunct of Assad's command, together with Iranian Revolutionary Guards. This includes heavily, more heavily armored and motorized divisions of the Syrian army. Pay attention. They have moved close to Kanitra in southern Syria. Now, if you are a Christian pilgrim or tourist who's been to Israel, you've probably been to the Golan Heights. When you go to the public observation point at the foot of Mount Hermon, and you look across the United Nations no man's land, you see Kunitra. It is visible from Israel. You can see it. Many of you have probably seen it with your own eyes and with binoculars. It's right there. You can't miss it. But when you have a constellation of forces on the side, acting in cooperation with Hezbollah and Iran, you know something is amiss. The United States and Israel have a strategy to counter the Iranian influence in Syria. Israelis have launched missile attacks on al Kiswa, south of Damascus, in this general area. This could potentially lead to a ground incursion of up to 12 to 15 kilometers by Israeli armored divisions. Israel has mobilized certain reserve forces in the event of the necessity of this taking place. But despite reports that Syria, under pressure from Russia, is backing away from its cooperation with Iran, they are saying one thing and doing another. To have Hezbollah wearing Syrian uniforms in working alliance with the Iranian Revolutionary Guard at Kunitra, spitting distance from the Israeli border, you can walk it, is something to watch. And it's happening this week in prophecy. This is not to be alarmist, wars and rumors of wars. But what's taking place is again largely being ignored by most of the international media, and it's very serious, and it has the potential to become something quite explosive. Thank you so much for listening. My name is James Jacob Prash. That has been this week in prophecy. God bless. Tell somebody about Jesus this week.